I went to see a play last night. It was It's a Wonderful Life. And it was done as if it was a radio broadcast and there was and and it's just people working in the studio and they're waiting for the actors to come. They can't because there's caught in a so snowstorm. So the sound guy and the owner's daughter, they all have to step in and play the parts, which was really great. I love the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. I, I just love it. And it brings a tear to my eye all the way through it. And of course, even with this radio play, I still had to hold back tears. Um, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic story. The, the angel getting its wings, we know that's not real. <laughs> it's oh. not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but the, the main point is, um, you don't know how many lives that are touched by one man or one person, right? And that, and to get that glimpse in that movie of what it would be like, um, it's just, it's a really thought-provoking movie for me, definitely. I just think about it. And then I hear Jimmy Stewart. Mary! Mary! Oh, Bedford Falls! <laughs> ah, sentimental hogwash! <laughs> Potter, the ultimate villain. Ah, uh, but it just, it, I just love that movie. Um, and so it always, for me, helps enter the time of Christmas and of giving of friends and everything that goes with it. And, and the Savior. Um, so my message this morning, last week I, we, we really focused down and we spent the time on two verses. Two verses and we're making some traction here in Luke 6. <laughs> Covering two verses, but this is some heavy stuff. And I really, man, God has really been speaking this week about his word and the supernatural essence of being one of his children. And it's really making me realize this is terrible as a pastor, but this is supernatural living. This is not, we're gathering here. I, I want to convey to you. Christ's message to us and how real it is that this is not chicken soup for the soul. This is not philosophy. This is not just pithy little sayings. This is reality. And the power that we have is the same that was exerted to raise Christ from the dead and lifted him to the right hand of the Father where he is King of kings and Lord of lords. We're talking about something real here. And we have been given this power in jars of clay and you know what's really helped me this week? I, I gave you a, uh, an assignment last week. I don't know if you remember, but I said try memorizing 1 Corinthians 13. Because we're talking about love. We got to know how to love people. Because this is a supernatural love that the common man cannot understand, comprehend, compre comprehend or not even have the capacity to carry out because they don't have the power of God. And 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8 says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It keeps no record of wrongs. And it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. I got it wrong already. But it does not dishonor others. Love does not delight in evil. 
but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. And so I've, I've been running this verse, these verses through my head all week. It's like, wow. I was convicted different times. It's like, whoa. Self-seeking? Whoa. Not proud? Whoa. Not patient? I gotta be patient. All these things. I mean, it, the word is convicting and it's there. And as I did that, I started thinking, God, I gotta just start. I've got to memorize scripture so it's in me because that's what, what works inside of us. So one of the first sections of scriptures I remember <clears throat> memorizing was Titus 2.11. Turn with me right now to Titus 2.11 because it is the outline of what it means to be Christ. What, what the Christian life is all about. Supernatural way of life. Titus is tucked in there before Hebrews after Timothy. <coughs> Titus 2.11. And I'm, I'm glad I memorized this one because this has always stuck with me. Uh, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And it teaches us, in other words, that same grace that brought salvation now teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now this right here, these verses are amazing because it's mentioning grace and you can, you can change that word grace to Jesus Christ all the way through. Whenever you see the word grace, it's synonymous with Christ. Grace means a pouring forth unconditional love. I'm giving to you, take it or leave it. Because God is love, he gives. And it's going forth. And that's what we've been talking about, this love. It's going out from us. We're, we're connecting with God in that sense. We understand his love. It's going out. And when we talk about salvation, there's three steps to salvation for us that God is working in us. The first is he saved us uh, from the penalty of sin. And that's mentioned here. Um, at one, uh, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It's come into the world, and it's Christ offered to us, and we are saved. It's a finished, finished work by Christ. Okay? The second part of salvation is sanctification, or making us into the image of Christ in our life. To take in God's word, to be transformed. Uh, in Romans 12, it says, uh, be, not be not conformed with the pattern of this world. They're in a rut, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means taking in God's word, even memorizing it, it's hanging there in, in, your, in front of your face all the time. <laughs> As, as you memorize it, you think about it, you meditate on it, it's there and you can't get away from it. It's hanging right there. And what, what's God's grace doing? This is the Holy Spirit's working in our life. That same grace is teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. That's our old self inside with its old ways. We have to tell it no. No. I'm a new creation in Christ. I have been given the power of the Holy Spirit. I am no longer under 
the satanic rule. He's no longer a slave master over me. I am a free instrument of righteousness, a slave to righteousness now. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm putting Romans, the stuff we've studied, all into this. It, it's falling into place here. And <clears throat> I, I can say no to it um, because here's, here's that, that tough word. Uh, and, and now I'm called to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this pre present age. That means self-control. That is huge for a Christian. That we now have the capability, the power to have self-control. To say no. And as far as that applies to what we've been talking about, when Jesus says, love your enemies, our natural old dead self wants to come to life, which it can't, but he, it wants to control us to say, give it right back. Retaliate to fire back. And for us, self-control means I'm walking with God and I need to put that tape back here of walking in the power of the Spirit in the, the divine dynosphere of God, that power place where I'm walking in the Spirit and, and my mind is seeing things from God's perspective and it's like, why would I go back to this old way of life? That, that's truly the way we got to think. That is the old me. It has been dead. It has been buried. It's crucified with Christ. It's dead. I've been made alive, new. I'm a new creation. This is reality. We have to understand this. I, we are a new creation in Christ. Um, the old man, international symbols are dead. That's, that's the old man we used to be. But now, we are made new in Christ. With, with extreme power. Uh, we, we have the power of God in us. And for me, that means I cannot no longer wallow in self-pity thinking, oh, poor me, I'm, this has happened to me, I'm a victim, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, I am a child of the Most High. I think of the movie Lincoln when, when he finally stood up in his roundtable meeting with his cabinet and said, I am the President of the United States clothed in immense power and I expect you to get the votes I need. You know, and everybody's just like that. And that's the power we've been given. The power of Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, the power of love. A love that is a kingdom love that is not of this world, that is powerful. And when Jesus tells his believers who are poor, blind, oppressed, sad, prisoners, that you've been made alive, you've been set free, you can see, you are my representatives in this world now. You know what? As I go through Scripture, it's we're, we're going to be covering fruit here in a few weeks in, 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 in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He, he goes to that next. And it's all tied together that when we are walking in the Spirit, we are producing fruit that the end game is always the reaching of people. No matter what. It, it's all about the Gospel going out to set prisoners free of everybody. And, and why I'm bringing this up is when Jesus says to love your enemies, that means to think in your mind, I've got to love them. Even though they hate me, they insult me, 
they mistreat me, they malign me, I've got to think like God because this is the way God loved us. 1 John chapter 4, it says, we know what love is because He loved us when we didn't love Him. I mean, His own enemies. He loved us and gave His own Son for us. We have that same mindset now as Christ to love our enemies and to do good to our enemies. That means in our actions we respond with goodness, not with closed fists. And we bless our enemies. That means to speak forth blessing to them. And then we're called to pray for them. If you're as convicted as I am about praying for enemies, we've got to do this. Because this is our mission field. The world will not know God's love until it sees something different about love. Something that they are not capable of. So we have to get that mindset and, and set aside our own selfishness of mm, they did me wrong. Why do they do that? Well, it reminds me here in Titus. I, I still want to finish the Titus 2 verses here, but just skip ahead a little bit to... Uh, Chapter 3, it says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, to show true humility toward all men. And then listen to verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Okay? Remember, we too were deceived, disobedient, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy. Okay, go back and look at old Scott in college life. Okay, you can't do that. It's not It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> but if you were go, to go back there, you would see me in this condition. And that's why when I look at other people, especially those who are enemies that, that hate the gospel, whether they're atheists, whether they're, I don't know, they just love their sin and we're trampling on their fun because they're going against God's standard. So in my mind, they can be enemies, but in my spiritual mind of knowing what God has called me, I have to see them as, hey, they're just like you. That's the way you were. Not, not any longer you've been saved and washed and clean, and still, you're a sinner. <laughs> but you are perfect in my sight. So we have to have that same mindset toward them as God had toward us. Got it? Um, and so that, that's part of our sanctification. If, if we're looking at Titus 2, it teaches us to say no. Th these are great verses to memorize and go over and over in your head and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. To, mean, to, to, to live a godly life means that the Holy Spirit is active in you, that you're confessing sin, and, and you're acknowledging Christ as your Lord, as He's driving you every day. Lord, I'm, I'm trusting in You. I'm resting in You. Speak through me. Work through me. 
We've only got so much time on this earth. Work through me in whatever you want to do. I'm here for you. And that's this present age. So that's the second stage of salvation. Third stage is this. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, this is our ultimate in salvation, to come face to face and finally see this Jesus. These people have been talking about forever. I've been yawning on about for a long time, this Jesus, to actually see him. The blessed hope, the glorious God and Savior Jesus Christ, and and that's when that old man is going to be completely taken away from us, and we will be like Christ. And what a glorious day that'll be! Uh, when we are made like Him, we'll have spiritual bodies like Him. No more old groaning crummy bodies that we live in. <laughs> Achy body, bodies are gone. We're with complete salvation at that point. There's good news in every step of this. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. We've been saved from the power of sin. And then we will be saved from the presence of sin. That it will be gone completely from us. Wonderful. And it's Jesus who gave himself for us. Even when we're enemies, he gave himself for us to redeem us, to buy us back from all that wickedness that we had. And he wants to purify for himself a people that are his very own. He said, I want these people. I want you to be mine. And the people will look at you and say, they see Jesus. They see our Savior through our actions, through our words. Uh, and we're eager to do what is good. Eager! Eager! <sighs> ah, I gotta love them! Are you crazy? I gotta be eager! I mean, this, this is what walking with Christ is. It's not easy. It's impossible to do these things. But with God, it is possible. When we trust in Him, pray, God, give me the wisdom, give me the strength, give me the gumption just to deal with these people and to love them. I'm going to love them to death. Okay? You got that? that that's what Jesus is saying. And he started it all out. Flip back with me to Luke 6. He starts this off by saying... In verse 27, Luke 6, 27. I, I, I don't know if you caught this, but I tell you who hear me. <laughs> he starts it out by saying, if you understand what I'm saying and you're hearing, understanding, listening, that's the power of God, number one. Because we cannot understand the Word without the Holy Spirit. So if you're ever wondering, I do this often of, am I really saved? You know, I, I go through that question in my mind, and then I have to get, go through and you confirm it with God's Word, because God's Word says that uh, all Scripture is, all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, that means teaching, for uh, correction, for reproof, Reproof means to go back over and understand, okay, I had this right in, my, in, in understanding God's Word. And so it's like, I have the capability of understanding what Christ says. Because years ago, I didn't understand this. This did not make sense to me. Because when I saw love your enemies, I, I, it was foreign to me. Until I became 
one of Christ. Now I comprehend it. I understand the cross. And, and so that's a confirming, um, a con- confirmation that you are his, one of them. A second thing is uh, Jesus is saying, look, if, if you hear me and understand me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So he's saying all these things because it's going against the grain of, of this, at this time, uh, the, the Pharisees were teaching that, you know, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. It's okay, hate your enemy. Because they're not one of us. And Jesus said, you heard them say that, I'm telling you something different. I'm telling you something that is a kingdom principle here. To love your enemy. And he's going to go further in this, in verse 29, of saying, these are actions you are to take to bless, uh, to think, act, speak, and pray for your enemies. Those four things. Keep those in your head. So next time, not if, but when, somebody comes against you, uh, whether you're telling them about Christ or whether you just being who you are and they come against you as an enemy, keep that in mind. I want to respond through actions and words with goodness and pray for them because that is the mission field. Um, And Jesus then goes on in verse 29. These are reactions to responses taken, directed towards you because you are Christ's. It says, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. So he gives some firing points here that we have to understand these in the context of witnessing and standing up for the truth that the enemy will lash out. When it, I've heard this used all the time. If someone takes no, if, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other. This does not mean if you're being mugged, say, "Oh, hit me again." You know, <laughs> like there's virtue in being humbled and not self-defense. Okay, this is not what it's talking about here. This is talking about persecution. This, this strike is the thought of humiliation, the slap. You know, the slap of humiliation. Um, they did that to Jesus. When, when the Pharisees brought him illegally at night into a, their courtroom, they were trying to get him to speak forth and incriminate himself, which is against the law. They're saying, tell us what you've been teaching and Jesus knows it's a setup, knows it's wrong, and he tells them, he tells the chief priest, he said, kind of, where are the witnesses? And I've been speaking openly for the last few years right in front of you. If you want to hear what I've been teaching, go bring those people in here and ask. I've done nothing in secret. And so he just sticks it right back to the chief priest. He's telling the truth. And it says one of the guards just whack, smacks him in the face. And that's what it's talking about here. It, it's that humiliation of, you know, if you speak to somebody about Christ and they just take it out on you, it's like, here's the mindset. Get ready because another one may be coming. But I am going to love you anyway. You can do whatever it takes against me. I will still love you. I'm still concerned about your soul. And this, this really becomes effective in, in places in this world right now where people are being persecuted for their faith. Whether it's China, North Korea, Vietnam, many, many places in the, in the Middle East where you can die for your faith. And they're, they're 
facing humiliation like this to the extreme. But we have every one of those disciples being persecuted. Jesus had told them, you're going to go out the sheep among the wolves. Be prepared to give an answer. Don't worry about it. I'll tell you what to say. But to have that kingdom love mindset, I'm going to love you. Because that's the end game. For all people to know God and His grace and His Son that saved them. <clears throat> Secondly, if someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. <clears throat> all these things happened to the early church that... Uh, they would take their cloak. Uh, the cloak was worn by Middle Easterners as uh, their outer cloak was their warmth because it did get cold at night and they would use that cloak as a blanket at night. And so a way they could persecute the Christians is by taking their cloaks, especially their outer cloak. And Jesus is saying, hey, you're going to take a cloak? Give them a shirt too if they want that. Don't give them, don't give them the happiness of... I, this makes me think of... I, I heard a story of a Japanese prison guard, and it's different than the Unbroken story. Do you remember that one? This one was a Japanese prison guard who was so terrible with the prisoners, and he kept... beating them and persecuting them. And he said, I could not understand it. They wouldn't recant anything. They wouldn't strike out at me, nothing. And he became a Christian through this whole experience. He said, I have never seen love like this that they displayed to me. That, that, that end just reminded of the uh, Jim Elliott. There was uh, five missionaries went, that went down to Ecuador back in the 50s. And uh, Nick Saint was the pilot. And they went to reach these, this tribe, Alka tribe, that was uh, nobody had ever had made contact to them, with them. And they had done it by flying the plane over uh, the area and dropping a bucket down in a rope, spinning around, and then they would give gifts to these people. But they knew that they were a very violent tribe. And so they finally landed like four miles out from the camp and tried to make communication. They ended up all getting killed, wiped out. And Jim Elliott, one of the missionaries, famous saying that he had, is uh, he is no fool who loses what he can't keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. I think that went through for a while. But it, it's a great thing to memorize because it's, it's very powerful. Um, but Nick Saint, he died as well as the other guys, and some of the wives went to that tribe to reach them, to tell them about Christ. Scary? Yes? Insane? Yes. What are, you, what are you, nuts? Going to the people that killed your husband? Husbands. And then Rachel Saint was the sister of Nick Saint. She went there and continued, stayed with these people, continued to <coughs> minister with them for 50 years. And many, many came to Christ. Even to the point they were going out as missionaries to other places, to other tribes, to teach about Christ. Because they had such a fantastic illustration of dying in order for the Gospel to come. And then, when Rachel finally passed away, they asked her son, who was three years old, Steve Saint uh, to come be a missionary there 
So he packed up his kids, his wife, left his business, went down there. Primitive, primitive uh, area. And lived with these people. And he said, I wish my kids would have known their grandfather that died. And he said, that was one of my biggest regrets in life, that they never know their grandfather. They hear stories of him. But they adopted another man in that village to be their grandfather. The amazing thing is, that very man that they adopted to be the grandfather was the one that killed their grandfather. You on that one, huh? I heard that. Wow. That's grace. That's an overreaching display. As I said, we are displays before the world God's grace, unconditional love, love going out, not expecting anything in return to give. God so loved the world, He gave, He gave, He gave. So we used to love our Lord. We give, we give, we give. That, that runs throughout our life. Whether it's stewardship of money, time, whatever. Give, give, give. Because we know that the blessings will come down. That's part of our inheritance. We're investing in our future. Our divine IRA. Okay? <laughs> Which, <laughs> which has a huge dividend, as we'll see. Um, so, in verse 30, it says, Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not, do not demand it back. So this is uh, a giving. Um, maybe people... Uh, My friend who was a pastor, I remember we were walking on the street and somebody was begging for money and it, he looked at him and he said, well, we know what's going to happen with this money. And he goes, I'm going to give. I'm like, what? He said, I can't judge. i got to leave this to the Father. I'm giving it to this man and I'm going to tell him about Christ as I give it to him. And... What? I, uh, and so that was a lesson for me, you know. There's greedy people in the world, but they are deceived. They are the same way I was. Um, Rustle around with that verse in your head. What, what does this mean? Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. And this is all in regard to persecution as well. Not, not oh, come take advantage of me, everybody. It's not that. It's, I've got, I'm intentional here. God, I'm asking you to, to deal with this enemy of the cross, of enemy of coming against me and my lifestyle or what I've said or who I am in Christ, okay? Which covers a very broad area. If we're living and speaking truthfully, um, that's part of love is to give the truth. And sometimes it's warning. Unless you repent, you will perish. That That's... We want them to know Christ. We want to know, want them to know the truth that it's just not some sentimental, lovey, gushy thing we're throwing their way. It's like, no, I've got a tr truth of Christ that He's died for you, same way He died for me, and He wants to give you new life, an eternal life, one that lives forever with Him. <clears throat> so this is all mental. I mean, all. All realistic actions we take. Verse 32, it says, if now he, he's speaking to people who have questions about this. If you love those who love you, 
What credit is that to you? Okay, what favor do you get? If, if you think you're serving God by just loving those who love you, so what? So what? That's easy. Even sinners love those who love them. The way the world is, you love me, I'll love you. You do me wrong, I'm, forget it. Okay? So this is, this is different. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Nothing. There is no credit in that. Even sinners do that. That's, when it uses the word sinners, it's talking about unbelievers. Harmatolos, which means uh, those who have not accepted uh, Christ as their Savior. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? If you're going to give it, expecting something to come back, you're just like anybody else in the natural world. There's nothing special about you. But, love your enemies. He says this again. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then, your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. This, this isn't saying that if, if you do these things, you'll be sons of the Most High. What this saying is, it will be manifested in you. That people will recognize you as who you are. As, Linda, you are my child. People will know through your actions that you are saved, that you are different, that you are empowered by God to do this crazy, crazy thing of loving enemies. It's not right. <laughs> okay? But you will, this is the most high God. You'll be sons. El Elyon in the Old Testament, the, the Lord on high. You are their, uh, His son. Because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. This is to remind us that God is kind. He's kind. We have to understand what kindness is. And, and it's part of that love of being patient. Um, in Peter, 1 Peter, he says, God, God is slow to anger. He's patient for everyone, waiting for them to come to redemption. Uh, he, he's, he's given us time to build a testimony, to come to the end of ourselves and finally come to that place where I don't have nothing before you, God. I'm a worthless sinner, wretch of a man. I need you. I need your grace. And that's when he pours it out. And so he's patient with all people and we have to keep that in mind with some of those jerks that God is patient with them. Don't write them off. Actually, that's what he goes on to say. Don't, don't judge and we, we'll, you will not be judged, which is misused all the time. That's what it's talking about here. Don't write people off and say, the Lord's condemned you, you're done. It's, it's like God's patience, His grace is still there. They're still drawing breath. So don't, don't step in and think you're God. But be gracious with them. Be, be long, persevering with them and revealing God in that way of loving them. Because they may have never been loved like that in their life. Right? Yeah, it's that old saying, people never read the Bible, you're going to be the only Bible they ever read is true. Most people are illiterate when it comes to the Bible. And they won't even be able to understand it if they're not a believer. I mean, they, the Holy Spirit can speak through His Word. He does. And, and saves people. Um, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. Um, but most won't really pick it up and look at it. Um, 
So we have to be the ones to initiate and be intentional that we pray for people. There are fruits. I'm telling you that right now. You, you can... Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits, who are mine and who are not. Those who are, who are walking in love, that are connected with me, praying, speaking to me on their behalf, what happens is the fruit is produced. The tree doesn't push out its fruit. Oh, I gotta work and push this out. It just happens. Because it's nourished, it's taking in what it needs, and a good, lively tree is going to produce fruit. And so it's going to happen. People are going to come through Christ through your actions, through your words. And we have to show that same graciousness because God is kind. To the wicked. Not only that, he's merciful. We're called to be merciful just as your father is merciful. That, that's the positive and the negative that God, God gave us what we didn't deserve. We didn't deserve. Praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spir spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before he created the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons according to his will and good pleasure. It's wonderful. And so these things are... are... Uh, Sorry, I'm going into my memorized scripture. I'm just having fun with it. I'm trying to memorize the whole book of Ephesians. <laughs> um, that he has given us all this grace. That's the positive part. He's given us righteousness. And then the mercy side of it, he doesn't give us what we deserve. We deserve judgment, punishment. Eternal separation from him. Hell. That, that's what we deserve. And I just heard this. This is a new one for me. You always hear people ask, how can God allow bad things to happen to good people? You know that one? I hear that a lot. How come nobody asks, how come... <laughs> good things happen to bad people. The opposite of that. Because God shouldn't be giving good things to bad people. That shows his patience, his kindness and mercy. Right? He is, he is all merciful. He's not holding our sins against us any longer if we're saved. Even when those who are not saved, he's still not judging them He's waiting. They have the lifetime to come to Christ. Many opportunities. And I also see this through... Uh, are you tired of me talking yet? I'm going a little bit longer because we don't have service next Sunday morning. Everybody knows. If you show up here, nobody's here. Come to my house, knock on the door, and I'll give you a sermon. But, <laughs> But we have 9 o'clock service because it's Christmas Eve. I just want to make sure everybody understands that. 9 o'clock pajama service. You come as you are. 9 o'clock at night. And we read through the story of Jesus and sing hymns. Um, where was I? Um, bad things happen to good people. Uh, catch up to where I was at. God's mercy 
means he doesn't hold anything against us any longer. It's been removed by the cross. Jesus has paid the complete penalty. And, oh, and, and even for those who don't know him, his mercy is being extended to them to allow them to breathe his air even while they're cursing God. The very breath they are breathing in and out is speaking Yahweh's name, which Yahweh means. It, it's, it's breathing in and breathing out. It's life. His mercy extends to them. So when we love our enemies, our, our hope is that they will see God's love and forgiveness and learn how to love and understand comprehend God's love for them. That's the purpose. If they don't, it's just one more thing in their life for God to say, I've been revealing myself to you. My glory is there. And you keep rejecting it. Keep rejecting it. Um, so nobody's going to go to hell to be separated from God unwill unknowing, unwillingly. It's their own choice. And um, that, that's the bad part of it all, the mercy. I mean, good part, and I don't even want to think about it. That, that's, having the same mindset, mindset as God is to have that, that compassion for people. I want to love them because I, don't, I know where that end game is taking them. And I don't want anybody to go there. And so it is, you've got to think about it this way. It is unloving for me to not tell them about Christ. I've, I've heard people say, you've got to love them. Um, and, not, and not preach the word. That's ridiculous. That's not true love. True love is truth of Christ, of telling them, um, man, we need Jesus. we got to be. In some way, you've got to come to know Him. Um, so God is using us. We... Uh, I just want to read the rest of this here. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. This, this doesn't mean to... This, this is misused all the time that we shouldn't judge people for sins. Well, of course not, but we can discern and say that's wrong, that's a sin. That, that's not what this is saying. This is saying um, I'm, you're a lost cause. You're dead to me. <laughs> You're dead to God, go to hell, type of thing. That's not, uh, we're not to do that. And God's going to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to treat you in that same way. Um, you'll be, do not judge and you'll not be judged. And do not condemn and you'll not be condemned. So we do not run around saying this person's condemned to hell, blah, blah, blah. We don't make that judgment. God does that. We can tell them, you will perish in your sins according to God's word. That's not what I say. That's what God has said. Um, but to forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. He, he's saying, give, and it will be given to you in a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He's saying, look, if you listen to this kingdom principle of loving other people, and you get this, and you do it, it will be paid back to you in full. And this is the way they used to measure corn. They'd put the basket between their legs. They'd fill it three quarters of the way up. They'd shake it, rotate it around, get that corn settled down even further so they could pour more in there. And then they'd shake it again and get it completely full till it was filling over full. That's what God is saying to you. I promise to you this will come back in a way 
And I know this is true because if you put up with somebody and in a godly way love them back, love them back, and they come to Christ, what a rejoicing moment that'll be. That's we gotta look end game for that. Lord, save them. Lord, save them. There's nothing I can do. It's all by your grace and the Holy Spirit's work. But I ask you to work through me, speak through me. May they come to Christ and see you for who you are. And when they do, they're going to be grateful. You're going to jump for joy. It said the angels in heaven rejoice. We're talking a mass rejoice over a single person coming to repentance. That they've seen Christ. So, I read this, say, yes, Lord, I understand that. Let me do this. Let me do this. Let me not be afraid to do this. Let me throw my old corrupt mindset aside and not take this personally because it's business. It's Jesus' business. It's Christ's business. Use me. All right, I'll give up. I'll quit. <laughs> but isn't this wonderful? This, this is what it means to have the power of God. Um, it, it's not of this world. This is real. Um, praise Jesus. Any, any questions, thoughts, objections? I object. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I just want to share when um, Al, that gentleman who was back in here, came and stayed with us and was on the church the next morning. Uh, one thing that he shared is he's been homeless and has worked with homeless and whatnot. Is he always emphasized, you know, if you give to someone who asks, you receive your blessing on your end. And it's up to them to decide whether they'll receive their blessing on their end with how they use it. He says, I, I don't think twice about it. Just give it to them. Let them choose. Let God work with them. Thank you. That's perfect. Yeah. Yes. You yes. do your part, it's up to them. That's, that's right. The, uh, Thank you. Because I refused it one time. And Justin did it. And I felt bad in a sense. When I was asking for money, I told him no. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, yeah. Yep. There's a there's something about that discerning and judgment though. A lot of people if you discern something, I'm not saying I'm saying right's right and wrong's wrong. I'm sorry. Thank but, you. Yes. That's but I'm right. not judging anybody. I'm not saying you're gonna go to hell. Right. That's not my job. Right. You know? But you got to warn people. Right, right. That, that's right. Discernment means I know the truth of God. He says to live this way. And if people are not living in that sense, it's like I know the bondage that they're in. That's up to them, but, it is. but it's still wrong. Right? It's still wrong, right. Right. So we still hold to the truth. But for an unbeliever, they've got to come to Christ first. They will not have any power to overcome anything else until they come to Christ. Well, I think a lot of, uh, I don't want to say, the person I'm talking about happens to be our daughter. Yeah. And I don't think necessarily that she is an unbeliever. But her approach is, if you say anything, don't start that crap with me. And I know she, I know that not think she believes. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't want to hear it, right? Because she's embracing her sin at this right. point. So exactly. So I can't go there with her. I mean, I don't see her that much anymore. But but I can't go there with her because it does nothing. But instead of her focusing on getting the word, she's focusing on arguing with me, right? Or pushing me back. So she is in God's hands. 
Right. I, I'm not going to even go there. Right. 